Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first round meeting. Um, you have before you, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, you have before you a copy of the agenda. I'm looking for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. And I'm going to ask that we keep our masks on unless we're speaking, and as well if we could speak up so that we had a problem with our camera, so that that system's down, so we're doing it on YouTube instead of our Facebook channel. So if we can speak up, that'll help those that are trying to hear what we have to say. <laughs> we're looking for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Councillor Dufert, seconded by Councillor Willows, all in favor? Thank you, motion carries. Item number three is any declarations of interest to me? Being another, we'll move on to item number four, which is announcements, awards, ceremonies, and presentation. Anything from council? Councilor Dewey, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just a couple of announcements. I, first, I want to offer uh, condolences to the Benoit family, the passing of uh, Ray Benoit last week. He was a long time uh, resident of Hay River, a businessman, a talented guy that raised his family in Hay River. And, uh, Certainly leaves behind a legacy. Our uh, I'll go rank in five five three is is named uh, in Ray's honor. As he was the kind of the driving force, the first guy to really start doing that. So it's there because of him. And, uh, yeah, secondly, I just want to congratulate both of our new councilors and uh, everyone else on the re-election. And looking forward to the next three years. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further from council? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I just echo that. Welcome to uh, um, just on the uh, I guess the eve of uh, Remembrance Day, I think that uh, ceremonies will not really go forward as normal uh, this year. But uh, I'd like to just uh, take a moment to acknowledge uh, veterans. Um, I believe today, particularly, is uh, set to honor Aboriginal veterans. Uh, of course, on uh, November 11th. Um, uh, particularly, uh, uh, I think of uh, the Canadians that fought um, the Second World War, First Canadian Army that liberated uh, Holland. Uh, in 1945, from uh, the tyrannical oppression of uh, the Nazis that started with segregation and ended in uh, the extermination of thousands of uh, innocent lives. Um, my grandparents were among the people that were liberated, so I just like to honor those uh, veterans and uh, say that they would be uh, grateful for that. Uh, anything further from council? Yeah, thank you, Worship. Just one thing from council, a, a bit of a personal connection here, but I just want to recognize that the birth of our director of finance, second child um, here in Hay River. And I just wanted to mention that because uh, they, they, they were able to have their baby here in Hay River through the mid program and uh, I think as the director would say it's it's uh, a privilege but uh, also uh, a big convenience <laughs> back at work the next day but anyways we thank we thank the, the healthcare staff especially in these times where where they are um, a little more restricted dealing with some of the bigger uh, COVID issues and such okay Thank you, Worship. Uh, we'll start today with the uh, Director of Finance and Budget. Good evening, thank you, Worship. A few updates from the Finance Administration. The Administrative Office is now reopened public during regular hours, uh, which is 9.35. So 
goes between 12 and 1. Um, you ask visitors wear a mask over here and social distance when in the facility. Um, to update, we received notice from MACA that they requested an extension on the deadline to provide uh, the town with the preliminary assessment role. Um, they've asked for an extra 60 days. Uh, so I'm working with my staff to determine if that's going to potentially have a ripple effect through and uh, delay the town in levying taxes. Um, the preliminary look, we're not expecting that it will, or if it does, it would just be an additional month. Um, but when I have an update on that, uh, I'll, I'll let council know. Um, otherwise, uh, my staff's been busy working towards our Q3 financials and the 2022 budget. Uh, both of which we're anticipating to bring to finance committee for a preliminary review next week, uh, with the goal to bring the Q3 statements to our the next council meeting on the 22nd. Uh, and as part of the 2022 budget process this year, uh, we're performing a survey which will be posted in 20 days. Um, this is this will uh, serve as a tool to collect information from the public and hopefully support some additional engagement. Um, for the past couple of years, we haven't had. Uh, any attendance when we've had um, with open house type presentations. So we're trying this just as a different avenue um, to see if we can get some feedback. Uh, that concludes my update. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Any questions for the Director of Finance and Council? Yeah, I just had a question on the um, on the uh, water bill and the fees that we're, we're charging now. Um, what kind of uptake did we take on uh, most people taking the online approach, or do we still have quite a few that are still getting mailed up? Um, at this point, uh, we've got just over 70% um, using electronics. So the system initially was implemented approximately five years ago, but we need the option. Um, through our bills, we were encouraging people to sign up. Um, at the end of the day, it was something that Finance Committee and subsequently Council approved as part of our fees and charges bylaw. And uh, really, it's just a cost, <coughs> the cost of, of putting a paper bill out in the mail. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a dollar for postage, there's a cost for the envelope, there's a cost for the employee's time. Um, so, you know, from a, a cost perspective, it's, it's purely a cost recovery measure. There is the environmental benefits of just sending, printing and sending out less paper. Um, it's something that we've been pushing for as administration to move to paperless. Um, we can't do it all overnight, but it's something that we're, we're continuing to make those changes. Uh, we, we did our best to communicate that with, with, uh, with the public. Again, we delayed implementing it several months. Um, and we, we posted that information on the utility bills. Um, so you know, there certainly was uh, some feedback from the public. We've had, at this point, three people that, that I've heard of that have communicated directly to administration um, as a concern. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think it's a, a thing that's a charge. It's something that's pretty common with, with banks and, and many other service providers. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. We'll go next to the uh, Director of Protective Services. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, currently, for the month of November, as of today, the department has done uh, eight ambulance calls, responded to one highway rescue call and responded to one fire call at uh, stick uh, Sunday morning. Um, other updates are, um, so I wrote up a fire report for the fire on Sunday morning at stick Hill. Um, it was a, a propane truck that uh, caught on fire. We were able to get suppression done. No other damage was done to any of the other tanks and facilities. So it was a good response. Um, our quotes for the fire smart project have been submitted. And they're being reviewed for the continued widening of the fire line into a fire guard on the west side of town. So those are all in. Um, working on a draft business plan for the protective services department this week as well. And uh, our update to current membership, we conducted uh, interviews with five new applicants last week and all five were approved. So uh, at the end of last week and this week, we've been onboarding all five new recruits. 
and bringing them up to speed. Um, so that'll be continuing through this week. Um, equipment, we've received that 10 SEBA tanks that were sent up for hydrostatic testing. And we'll be looking to send out 10 more tanks this week. Um, tender for electric cod. The medic two has been drafted, and if it isn't posted, it will be shortly. Um, we'll also be looking to get all our units in for winter servicing this month as well. So we'll be moving units in and out for that. Uh, department training. Um, two weeks ago, we held an officers' meeting to set the training schedule for the remainder of the year. And uh, last week, we trained on vehicle extrication. So some of the new recruits got to have some hands-on experience. And uh, this weekend, we're planning on conducting a nice rescue course for the department, just given the time of year. And if the ice is right, it makes training conditions really good for that. And uh, moving forward, we're going to be looking to prioritize training for the new recruits. Uh, we'll be looking to get a community-based defensive course for them, just so they drop to speed and functional in the fire ground when it happens. And that's all I have for it. Any questions from council for our director of services? Go ahead, Council Dupper. Thank you, Your Worship. No question. I just want to say um, great work on the five new recruits. That's awesome for a little town like us to have so many new recruits at once. Awesome job. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for our director of protective services? Thank you, Your Worship, the Director of Recreation and Community Services. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, congratulations on the election or on the election. Um, I think, as Council is well aware, uh, the community center remains closed at this time. Uh, to my understanding, there will be further discussion at item 7G. Um, it's uh, it's been a lot of work uh, for myself and, and for recreation staff to uh, adapt to the uh, public health orders, uh, both uh, the one that is will be discussed at item seven G, but also the temporary uh, gathering order that affected the uh, the region. Uh, I do believe that we've had uh, communications uh, with local partners as well as public health but that's taken up a lot of my time in the last little bit and i've had support from staff um, staff are all, have also been um, doing some uh, maintenance and operational changes that uh, that were afforded because of the temporary closures um, maintenance staff have taken advantage of the late snow and done some uh, some uh, repairs uh, and preparations for for next season that uh, they normally wouldn't be able to do in the month of October and early November. Uh, programming staff uh, have taken advantage and, and done some training uh, with some junior staff and also uh, put in place some operational changes, which I think will be profitable for us uh, going forward. And, and similar with the aquatic staff also, uh, we have been uh, operating only with uh, permanent and, uh, and term staff. Uh, casual staff have, uh, have not been uh, working shifts uh, during the temporary closures. Um, but uh, I'm hoping to discuss that, discuss that further again at, at item 7G here. Uh, those are my updates at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Any questions from Council for Director of Recreation? Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to Thank you, Worship. Um, I'll be providing the updates as I am acting for the um, Director of uh, Public Works and Services as well. So I'll start uh, with that area. Um, most of our information uh, is provided in the monthly report that's also on the agenda today. So just uh, a few items to add to that. Um, first off, we, um, we finally got that first snowfall this weekend. Um, we fought hard, I guess, uh, in the last couple of weeks to, to avoid having to do snow removal. Um, <laughs> but uh, crews did start the first sanding this weekend. Uh, on Saturday, there was icy conditions there, so it did come in and, and do the, the main intersections and streets in, in town. Um, driving to work this morning, I'm very pleased to see that the high priority areas in our snow removal plan were executed and through sanding and, and some snow removal. So. High priority areas of fire hall, 
highway intersections and, and uh, Coutrice, Coutrice Street. So all pu public sidewalks were cleared as well. Um, we have had some <laughs> conversations actually over the weekend with, uh, with, with a private sidewalk contractor uh, for snow removal on Coutrice Street. So discussing schedules and coordination um, with aims to uh, improve uh, specifically that street and, and access given the, the larger the larger sidewalks that's there. Um, with our Caribou and Riverview present project, again, updates are in the reports council uh, coming up on the agenda, uh, but we are working on final adjustments and, and clean up before the winter season, which is really here now. Um, worked with uh, inspections last week, just to then find some driveway adjustments, fill removal, uh, delineation of valves and curb stops. And the town will be ma maintaining uh, the, the road with snow, snow removal over the winter and then pass back on to the primary contractor as uh, year two of construction resumes. Um, with our top town hall abatement project, so we're expecting to start work as early as next week with contractors on site to begin that work. Um, we are working on their construction, site containment, and communication plans. And then uh, actually we are working right now on contract documents that will be used, or sorry, tendering documents that will be um, published for, um, for demolition of the building uh, scheduled for this year as well. Um, we've been really busy the last couple of weeks working on a Bale Island shoreline protection project in terms of uh, an application through the disaster mitigation and adaptation fund. So this is another item on the council agenda today to ensure uh, we have uh, council approval on it, uh, but it is for a $1.2 million application through that fund for, for the Alaska road berm repairs uh, that have been, we've seen sustained or sustained some damage uh, this year during the spring breakup and that road has been closed since then, uh, but it also includes the enhancements to the, the berm system. Uh, our water treatment plant feasibility study request for proposals closed uh, first day of November, I think. Uh, we received uh, three bids uh, that we are reviewing uh, now and hope to make an award on as early as this week. And that's for completion of that feasibility and preliminary design type work uh, by the summer, summer 2022. Uh, administration has a zoning bylaw. Uh, it's been an extensive engagement period and consultation for that bylaw. Uh, we have a draft version that we're just uh, reviewing now. It will come to this council and the public uh, for final review and council approval. Uh, also been busy uh, myself, um, our HR manager and, and uh, our civil infrastructure manager conducting interviews for the director of of uh, public works and services. So we've completed those interviews and, and hope to make uh, an offer this week. Uh, also our public works supervisor uh, advertisement has closed and beginning reviewing resumes uh, this week as well. Um, I have several items uh, from my desk that I can update on as well, but maybe just a pause to see if there's any questions or worship to me on public works end. Any questions for our <coughs> acting director of public works? Just a question on the list station. Uh, is that project still continuing on throughout the winter? Like, I think so. Most of them now, I think. Okay. Is that project continuing on for the whole winter and that will be completed by the spring? Or do we know have a date of completion? Freshman. Anything else now? Thank you, Worship. Yeah, work's completed. The masonry work is uh, pretty much completed now, I think. And uh, connections of gas line was occurring along that road over the last week. Um, so projects going essentially is scheduled and is uh, planned to open April of 2022. Any further questions? Council Bill. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's an HR question, so you may be getting to it, but I forgot to ask anyway, since we were talking about HR. Have we got anywhere with the bylaw? Um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but uh, the young gentleman who had the job before, I mean, he did a hell of a job, let's face it. 
And the community, I mean, I don't think I can drive down the streets on a single day here in the last week or two where people aren't running stop signs again. And now that we're getting into the winter months, it's it just seems to be the norm. Nobody stops for a stop sign. So a little concerned about that. And I know we have some of that contract, but I mean, it's only doing one run a day. It's not really sort of covering the area. So I'm just hoping to get a bit of an update in terms of recruitment on that position. Thank you, Worship. So, yeah, the, we did run the competition for that. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to identify um, any successful or, or um, applicants that would uh, fit the, the position. So, um, we we have been meeting to discuss it and, and looking at other options, including um, development and training uh, for the bylaw portion of it. Um, as you may know, that job also has responsibilities around emergency. Um, response with supporting fire and, and ambulance, which is uh, a growing support need, as our um, director of protective services has presented to you. Uh, numbers are up, and so more frequency there. So we are having some discussions and hoping that we might find someone local that would uh, that has part of that experience and we could put into the development position. So conversations are ongoing. Uh, in the in the interim. We have been able to operate with a uh, contracted services. They're doing daily checks. Um, the results, or actually October's results are in your council package there. So we do uh, have identified um, areas where we will, we will occasionally put attention to, such as when the schools um, were, were open for the fall. Uh, we did do checks in the school zones. Um, we, we liaise with the RCMP as well and recognize that they have uh, an important role in you know, traffic enforcement as well in the community. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lee, you yeah, just had another question about uh, the old town hall. Uh, are we, when we say the old town hall, are we still, are we also talking about the old fire hall as well? Like, is that all included in the abatement and the demolition will be all, all together? Uh, that's correct. Any further questions from council? Thank you, Worship. Um, so yeah, busy week uh, working primarily with the uh, director of recreation on our public health uh, gathering orders um, through the interpretation procedure support external and internal communication. Um, we are advancing the community housing plan. Uh, project. There is a uh, the advisory committee has been meeting um, to discuss. There has been some draft documentation that's been presented to the advisory committee, uh, tabletop exercise uh, or research analysis. Um, they are, we are scheduling and preparing for two online based uh, focus group engagement meetings that are being scheduled for the week of November 15th. Uh, so the topics will be on land acquisition and development and housing affordability. Uh, we have a long list of stakeholder invitees uh, that have been developed through the advisory group and the consultant, and so they'll be contacted to participate. Um, there was supposed to be a public uh, engagement option as well. I think we're changing it to some uh, to a form of sort of a, a pop up booth or drop in booth, um, but just due to some of the COVID restrictions that we've had, it's uh, with, with the temporary order. It's been um, we haven't been able to do that. So we are looking at rescheduling that for early January, I believe. Uh, also been working on the resubmission of our new solid waste management facility funding application uh, through federal ICIP program. Um, that is now prepared and uh, planned for some resubmission this week. And uh, fingers are crossed that we will get the funds for that project. Uh, also on the ISIP front, uh, we did execute an agreement the, by the mayor and the GNABT for our three green space projects, which are funded through the community culture and recreation stream. Uh, so we'll begin those projects uh, really over the fall, some or over the winter, some planning activities, uh, but construction is into uh, 2022. Uh, I'm also preparing for our new council orientation. So a reminder to this crew that uh, there is the orientation scheduled for November 26, it's just the afternoon, uh, 4 p.m. and onwards, and then all day on November the 27th, the Saturday. So materials are, are being put together, uh, quite a big package of materials that will be delivered through that um, 
that orientation. Uh, we're also working on our departmental business plans. So each department is uh, developing a business plan or updating business plans for the 2022 year. Um, that will uh, support our budgeting process. It'll be part of our council orientations and uh, our own administration's workforce planning for, for next year. With the electrical franchise, uh, working with the MACA most recently, uh, with MACA and the GWT, to discuss options for our short-term financing that would be associated with the town's purchase of the electrical assets from NUL. Um, it's a very short-term transaction that would see us then selling uh, those to uh, NTPC through the franchise agreement execution, but there is a, um, a bit of legislation and uh, determination of how that will look. So primarily uh, being supported right now by our director of finance. Um, we're also meeting regularly, monthly, with the uh, NTPC to, to keep that project moving forward. Um, had a meeting today with the Senior Society to support the uh, submission of a $50,000 application through the Good Food Access Fund. Uh, this fund, if they're successful, which they have been in the past through this, this fund, is to support delivery of food to the vulnerable sectors in the community, including seniors, some of our Indigenous populations, um, soup kitchen, homeless people. So um, I'm happy to support that application. Uh, also had a meeting today uh, with Canor to discuss potential funding possibilities for economic development uh, type projects for our community. Uh, a lot of Canor's funding is actually for the private sector, but we have been able to um, access some funding in, in the past for um, projects that especially support tourism uh, within the community. So. Uh, have discussed a couple of projects that are on our on our plan, on our ten year plan, uh, including the downtown revitalization project and some dog development. So waiting on more information, but it's just conversation that's occurring on uh, where a good fit might be found. Uh, as it was noted uh, by Councillor Groenwegen, remember to stay uh, it's, it's this week. Conference brief uh, will be delivered by the mayor's office to the, the Legion. Uh, Legion is having some uh, restricted events uh, that day, so just check out their Facebook page or contact the Legion for more information. Uh, but we're also sharing information through our own information through the newsletter and Facebook this week. Uh, have a meeting schedule, a case management meeting with uh, the Union of Northern Workers this week to. Uh, review and try to move through some of our long-standing grievances. Uh, these are going back many years. So uh, both parties' goals are around <coughs> um, finalizing, finalizing those. Uh, we've also completed, uh, or have a draft now updated of a consolidated lease agreement for MTS uh, with the land leases to the town. So these are uh, an agreement for all the lands that they have used or, or have um, that came out of the acquisition of NTCL. So it's a significant uh, agreement for, for the land leases. Um, also had a meeting with the Department of Lands to discuss the bulk land transfer opportunities for uh, commissioners and territorial lands. So this is something being, um, has been pushed and supported by a higher level of GWC government this year. Maybe aware that Yellowknife has been working through um, a bulk land acquisition through the Department of Lands, uh, we have an opportunity to do the same. Well, we do have a uh, what's over a decade old uh, MOU with lands to see land transfers. We've executed most of those now. And this would be lands for, for more future developments, such as the new landfill, um, a new potential water treatment plant, uh, some of our lagoon areas, and, and anything else that we have had lease agreements in place that. Uh, the town might have an interest in acquiring fee simple title too. So um, we'll be working through that and bringing uh, any applications to council forward. And I think that's it on my, my list. Uh, on behalf of administration, do you want to recognize and, and welcome the new council and look forward to working with this group? There's a, a lot to come over the next few years. Look forward to building and executing those plans. So um, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions or comments? Moving on to item number six. 
6A, which is the monthly policing report for October 2021, for information purposes only. Um, any comments or questions regarding Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. 
the amount of approximately $1.2 million to support the shoreline flood mitigation project. Town's financial contribution associated with the $1.2 million application is to not exceed $0. Thank you. Second by uh, Councilor Bouchard. Any questions from Council? Go ahead, Deputy. Yeah, so I just had a couple of questions. If we could just talk a little bit about the project itself. Like, what do we expect to be able to accomplish with the 1.2? Like, is this mainly the, uh, I know West Point was pointed out in the end of the report, but uh, is that more, are we looking to do more burn work? And uh, is there any other mitigation that we're looking at doing? Yeah. And maybe just clarification on that $0 thing. Uh, Kind of read the year, but okay, zero dollars meaning how much do we have to chip in? And usually it's 75, 25, 70, 30, whatever. In this case, we are hoping that because of we've done this as a partnership, okay. and um, yes, this is to fix the existing berm. We look up there, which is Alaska Road, and which is closed right now because of the erosion that is happening. So, and it will. Um, build up, I believe, on the north side as well. A bit of a berm where we had uh, vertical one, inflatable one, oh, yeah. whatever you call um, But I am going to go to our acting director, public works, and just fill in blanks. So. so, thank you, Worship. I, I think you've done a good job presenting at the high level. Um, yeah, the road is closed. It's, it's been impacted by erosion uh, from, from, from uh, spring breakup. <laughs> It's been an area that's been recognized as an area of concern with erosion on that burn north channel area. It's um, and, and just to be clear, that's that's right across from like where the West Point First Nations area is and, and the in the band office. So um we this council's had discussions and administration's had discussions and met with West Point First Nations before um, even this occurred this year, uh, talking about erosion concerns. Uh, we have received funding through uh, getting the name now, but climate change based funding um, to support some of the, uh, again, before before this damage occurred, some of the, the opportunities in that area. Uh, that's where the Aqua Dam solution, the temporary dam, came from last year. And now what we're looking through with this project more specifically is I think it's about 100 meters of uh, sheet pile. Type of infrastructure or type of support that will go along the shoreline. Uh, we did present a couple options and consulted with West Point First Nation on it, but that was the one that we both agreed was the best option. The other option was actually around moving the road into, into the community. Um, and yeah, the extension of the berm is along uh, that first entrance when you come into the West Channel or West Point First Nations area where we had the aqua dance uh, by the Oxbow Creek. Which sometimes sees a backflow of water uh, that causes flooding into that area of the community. Um, there will be gates in the design of the center right now. There's gates installed to allow for a one-way type of flow of water um, under under flood conditions. So uh, yeah, the 100 percent acts are the the disaster mitigation and that adaptation fund that uh, supports projects over uh, one million dollars in size. And so we, we scoped it appropriately to try to get those dollars. And through, uh, because of the connection with the indigenous, with the West Point First Nation community, is the, the hope is that uh, we will get the 100% dollars. Um, but that's that's the, the primary focus in, in that area right now, identified as a top priority is obviously we're starting to actually see infrastructure fail. But, Thank you, Dr. Smith. Any further questions? Council. This is a perfect example of partnership. This is a good thing. Benefits are mm -hmm. as well as other things. Good stuff, guys. All in favor? Thank you. Make sure you Item 7G, reopening of the community center with EEC requirements. So um, I am going to let administration speak. Um, I know that ongoing over the past little while, um, we had a bit of a reprieve before we had to make a decision on this. With the lockdown that we were under, so um, there are different communities out ahead of us. I believe Yannick will be um, making a motion tonight as well. So uh, we're not alone in this, and I understand that uh, the 
talk on your first meeting, guys. And, and um, so I hope everybody comes in with an open mind and uh, there's good discussion. It's not something I'm sure that there isn't one of us in here that wants to um, leave anybody out. It's not who we are as a community, it's not who we are as people, and certainly not leaders. So um, I'm going to ask that again, everything comes through the chair. Everybody will have a chance to speak and speak for the most probably. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ethel to go to the Thank you, Worship. Uh, so, yeah, the report's been submitted in the council package, which outlines uh, in more detail uh, some of the background and includes the options that were presented or options that were considered presented and worked with the uh, public health officer. Uh, but just a bit of background. So, on October 22nd, the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer did issue the gatherings order that was applicable to um, the entire Northwest Territories. Uh, at that time, we were operating on our own temporary restrictions, so we've got a lot of time to work through this. Uh, but essentially, the gathering order is that no more than 25 people would be allowed indoors and no more than 50 outdoors. Um, but there's further restrictions on high-risk activities uh, for indoors, such as uh, indoor sports and, and swimming. Um, so those organizations that want higher numbers or um, to host those high risk type activities uh, need to submit an exemption permit to the Office of the Chief Public Health Officer. So that includes us as an organization for our community center, as well as the user groups, many user groups that we do have that use the facility. So, um, Administration, we researched and analyzed those uh, options through consultation with the local user groups, uh, the public health, uh, the NWT Association of Communities, uh, other tax based communities, and, and our own recreation committee. Um, options that were considered I mean, one was the option of just a mixed vaccination status, um, which, uh, which really limits. Uh, much below 25 people in any area or activity within the building. In some cases, activities would not be allowed. Um, sometimes activities cannot occur at the same time, such as walking track uses the same open space as the, uh, as the ice surface. Uh, we looked at the option of a proof of vaccination certificate for high-risk activities only, where we'd have reduced participants in that case, of, again, much lower than 25 um, per area or activity. Uh, appointments only potential for some activities and blocked out times completely for activities. Uh, we looked at the option of a blanket uh, proof of vaccination certificate for the entire community center. So that would be uh, near normal type occupancy allowances through that. Um, but we uh, came up and are presenting a recommended option, a hybrid type option uh, for the uh, proof of vaccination certificate for the community center. Um, but with exemptions for certain spaces. So the application to vary uh, would be required for uh, any activity that is not under the proof of vaccination certificate requirement. Um, I guess in, in discussions through with all of our user groups uh, that use the community center, all of them have expressed an interest in supporting or submitting a uh, proof of vaccination certificate requirement, again, to maximize uh, their numbers. So uh, seem to be a lot of alignment there. Um, the recommendation really uh, maximizes the number of participants um, in the recreation activities within the community center uh, so that user groups are not limiting access below the registration numbers. Um, not sure where things may head in the in the future with some of this, um, that, you know, with the temporary nature. Um, in fact, public public health allowances will evolve in time. But for what we know, for what's in front of us right now, to get the community center opening uh, open and, and maximize uh, our recommendation is to move forward with that uh, with the vaccination option that's highlighted in the in the report. 
And I just wanted to maybe Stefan's been doing a lot of the work, our director of recreation. Um, a lot of details, of course, and procedures and how this would be implemented and the responsible uh, uh, Stefan's worked through with his team. Um, we are prepared to open tomorrow. Uh, and allow future groups on. Anything else that you think is worth mentioning that I may have missed or misrepresented? No, I don't think I think that summarizes it well. As, I think as does the report that I think council's questions and discussions are probably discussed mostly at, uh, at this point. Okay, so I'm going to get a motion on the table. I'll take a motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move the council of the town of Haver to the recommendation of the Haver Community Center reopen on November 9th with proof of vaccination certificate required for persons entering the facility who are 12 years of age or older and the understanding of some mixed vaccination allowances may be permitted by the public health for rentals and events. Thank you. Second, Mayor. Okay, so um, I would like to remind everybody this isn't a policy we're doing. We are looking at our options through the public health order. Um, and I'm going to open it up for questions, comments, and council. Let's go ahead. Just a short few comments. Uh, council will consider a debate of proof of vaccination policy tonight. Uh, as it relates to the town properties and in particular the recreation center. It is not my intent to discuss vaccination mandates that are currently required by federal, provincial, and territorial governments. There are strong opinions on vaccination mandates, but that discussion is not what we're being asked to consider tonight. For me, tonight's discussion is about how do we best reinstate normal business practices in our operation of the recreation center. In creating public policy, there will always be those who agree and those that disagree. I wanted to check recent polling of Canadians as, a rate, as it relates to support of proof of vaccination. The support runs anywhere from 75 to 80 percent of Canadians supporting proof of vaccination. If we are making this decision tonight and we start from a position of strong support by the majority, then in my view, it is a policy or procedure well grounded in public support. We are being asked tonight to support a temporary policy to provide the majority of our community members the ability to get back to some sense of normality. By supporting this recommendation by the town administration, we provide the tools for staff to operate its facilities under the direction and guidance provided by the Chief Public Health Officer's recommendations. Just quick, two quick notes. Charles Dent, Chair of the Northwest Territories Human Rights Commission is on record this morning as saying that proof of vaccine certificates are not a violation of human rights. Further, both the Northwest Territories Health and Social Service Authority and the Hay River Health and Social, Ser Social Service Authority will not support or perform PCR tests with a view to not supporting vaccine mandates. So with that information, I will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. Any other comments? Thank you, Mayor Boyle. You guys, I just had some questions uh, just on this discussion when we were talking about the um, our options that we looked at, and we talked about the mixed vaccine. Can we get a little more detail on what does that mean? Um, so the so the, I know you've got the building broken down into sections there. So the rink. And I know all the organizations that are using the rink are had to do this. Their 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 plans to the territorial um, organization. So can we just get a little more detail on what this what the mix does and what it allows for. Does it allow any non-vaccinated people to rent certain parts of the building? Thank you, Worship. So are you speaking towards the option that's presented? Yeah, well, we just made a motion to that, right? Okay, yeah. Um, you want to go in on? Yeah, so uh, what, what it allows for is it, it allows for, oh, thank you. Uh, what it allows for is it allows for individuals or groups that are uh, looking to use the facilities to, it, it allows the town, uh, permanent recreation and the town 
to work with those individuals in those groups uh, to determine if it's something that uh, that we could support uh, and that we could we could accommodate. And uh, but then the individuals or the group are required to submit an application to very to, to public health. I've had many uh, several discussions with public health representatives, and, and they they've indicated that they're willing to, to work and to to try to include those uh, those types of activities. Um, and, and that's what we're recommending because it does allow for the for that option and that ability. Um, and, and and I think there is there's room and there's a willingness to, to try to, to try to accommodate that way. Uh, the other options that were presented or one option that was presented was that there would be no uh, no vaccination uh, requirements or that there would be vaccination requirements, proof of vaccination requirements strictly for certain activities, but that limited the use of the building significantly. Uh, and, and it meant that certain areas in the building, because they're, they're high traffic areas and where there are areas that are shared, uh, it meant that uh, there would be a lot of times where we would, not be, we would not be able to use one area of the facility because another area is adjoined and, and being used in public health. Uh, they've, got, they've got concerns with those types of, uh, and, and those, that's what they're restricting, is the, the multi-use uh, facilities. Uh, and and uh, it, in my communications with public health, it seemed like an easier way, an easier and a, and a better way to, to resume operations at the facilities and to work at accommodating and, and, and working with the exemptions and, and the requests that will come to make sure that we can continue to, to increase operations and, uh, and services going forward. Uh, this is a this is a first step. Much like when we resumed um, reopened the facilities in September 2020, we didn't reopen all the facilities uh, at first, and we, we we were able to bring back services gradually. And to me, in this situation, with the gathering order um, and and the, the measures public health have, have put in place, to me, this is the best way to start that process once again. Thank you, director. Further. Yeah, just and my next question is about the timeline of this uh, is, is, is going forward. Is, are we looking to make this a mandate for three months, six months, or are we following the CPHO until they make a decision? We keep status quo. Um, and again, can I just reconfirm that all the user groups at the current facility have completed their their uh, their proposals to the CPHO or whoever they have to, to their organizations to go forward and how that would work. Because let's say we have the walking track going on, but we have minor hockey playing at the same time. They're going to have staff there. We're going to have staff there. Like, how is this all going to work for you? Yeah. Pass that back to yeah. Sorry. I missed on the, uh, uh, I mean, the user groups, as far as I understand, have all submitted their. Uh, their um, up to our exemption permits or paperwork and uh, are being ready to open uh, tomorrow uh, under under the option that we presented. So, um, sorry, the first question. Uh, oh, timeline. Oh, timeline. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so you know, we, the information that we have is uh, the order. I mean, the order is in place. So it's uh, indeterminate. I guess at this point, um, it's up to public health if they want to make changes there. Um, I think it's it's safe to say that there'll be there'll be um, you know uh, things that will be worked out in time as well that might change. Uh, testing is still kind of seeing some evolution in in, in uh, discussions and in policies uh, for staffing and say the GNWT as well. So uh, we'll see. But at this point, it's it's in place uh, while the gathering order is uh, in place. Just one more question. Further, I'll just, further, I'll just further. let everybody else ask some questions. Sorry, the uh, the other question was, yeah, are we were we given the option or allowed to give the option of a negative test within a couple days? Like I know some of the places in Edmonton, you can do that or uh, just go there and go to a hockey game by doing that. Is there is there was there options available in that way given to us or considered? Yeah, thanks. There, there's discussions there. I mean, the public health is um, 
basically saying that it, it, it would be uh, quite difficult to implement. It wouldn't be something that they would support, that the public health um, uh, definitely wouldn't support uh, the testing processes for you know, a systematic type uh, uh, cases. So it's it's something that uh, could evolve in time. I'm, I'm speculating a bit, uh, but the potential, you know, for some process that a, a municipal government uh, might be able to administer. I don't know, know if there's any other comments that you've heard. Um, might add to that, but uh, I guess what I would I'd say is that we did ask uh, a few times uh, for negative testing, and, and uh, it was pretty clear that public health would, would be supporting. And, and I did ask even hypotheticals of if the town was to explore that option, and I, I was basically told not to explore the not, not to explore the option, uh, and that. Um, it's not it's not being recognized by public health uh, at this point for uh, for a valid option for the with with the current current uh, system for receiving um, variants from the public health. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Go ahead, Councillor McGill. Um, so it's temporary. Um, and we really don't have an idea of how long it would be. Um, that's uh, disturbing. Yeah. Um, uh, I know there's lots of concern in the community. I spent the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday on the phone and answering emails. Um, but you say 25 people at indoor locations, so that would be individual rooms, right? Okay, so all that information is in here. The application, for example, because each application is treated differently through the again, this is chief public health office yes. mandate, not ours, not what we suggested we should do. We sat down with an environmental health officer as well as the chief public health office to try and figure out exactly. How, much, how we could go about doing this. So I think a big thing to note is that, yeah, COVID has, since inception, since this council has been fighting this invisible enemy, I guess, there has been uh, constant change. And that's another thing that throws people throughout it. I think that it's ever changing and that there's no guarantee that it'll be a year or two years out. So I think that that's a concern, but again, this council or previous councils have followed what the chief public health office has recommended in the past. And um, so trying to work through that. So for example, when you read down when looking at the pool, can we operate a pool with the maximum of 10 people allowed in it? And again, it's when you ask the questions, it's well, how do you wear a mask in the pool? How do you keep kids 10 feet apart or six feet apart, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those are, yeah, there is no, we can't, I, I'm certainly not going to ask my, our administration to comment on um, the CPHA. I think we put, or they put together an amazing presentation that should answer the majority of those questions. But, um, so if it's specific to, again, this is not a policy we're creating, this is nothing that we are doing, and I know it's frustrating for a lot of people, and I... In the same board as you, I've taken a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, letters, etc. Um, hearing both, both from both, mm -hmm. both parts of the back, the proof of vaccine and non proof of vaccine, and what it means. But I think the big one is if we can just keep it to, if we're going back down into the the weeds, we're we're going to go around the all night long. So specifics to to your concern. I guess is is yeah. I just uh, I mean I wonder if we've done uh, requests for variants in the past, but that doesn't seem to be an option. So we just it seems like a rather heavy-handed thing. And if all the kids are unvaccinated, will they also be allowed into the facility as well? I can answer. Go ahead, Nancy. Did you wish to start the last question? I was applied for those above the. 
Um, but it's uh, your, your uh, counselor Miguel's question on the uh, 25 allowances, just to be clear that that's, that's a general statement, but it's in, in situations where it's high risk activity, such as indoor state, uh, indoor sports, it's actually much less. And it does depend on multiple variables within the facility. But in cases such as, um, it, it can be complex, but in, in say, a uh, case for curling, uh, 16 people at the, the pool with the family, I think that's in consideration of staff as well. So at 25, is, is a, uh, there's, a, there's another point below it that speaks towards the actual um, restrictions for high, high risk activity. Thank you, um, Director of Recreation. Yeah, just a little further to that. Okay, because we did have the understanding initially that each of the rooms could be allocated the maximum allowance to see 25. And it was confirmed that that's not the case. Uh, and again, it's the adjoining spaces. And, and there would be further complications if, if there was not a, a proof of vaccination uh, uh, verifications. Those lobbies would have to be cleared. Like, let's say we have a swim time. Uh, the, the lobbies would have to be cleared before another group would go into the, into the pool or even before another group would go into the, the, uh, the arena. Uh, another thing that, that's impacted would be that our concession operator would have to operate out of the community hall, which would mean that some of our youth programs that have been run in there and some of the rentals. So they, it's not just an occupancy uh, situation. It's really about how the facilities can operate. And some of it, it gets into the scheduling and the scheduling would then impact. It would, it would reduce a lot of the programs that have been running. Uh, and, and again, uh, impact our, our regular ICE user groups and, and whatnot. So, regardless whether there is a, a vaccination policy or whether there isn't uh, for the entire building, uh, a portion of, of residents are, are going to be impacted by, by the services at the community center. Uh, this, again, this is a way to start reopening the facilities and, and resume operations. Uh, but there are limitations uh, that that has to be understood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, I, did, I did ask about the uh, so uh, children who are vaccinated because they're below twelve years old. Will they sign access to children? No. Council yeah. yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And an interesting point that uh, the director of recreation just brought up is revenue loss. Uh, it was interviewed by the council in Yellow Lake at a new meeting today. Their loss of revenue is estimated to be put in the neighborhood of $213,000 uh, per year if they do not adopt a uh, vaccine. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what our numbers are, but that's you know significant amounts of money out of our coffers. And there's only one way to raise that money, to replace that money. That's either cutting services or raising taxes. So let's not lose sight of the ability and the opportunity to restore our services to the level they were pre pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I can echo everyone here when I say that this is probably a torturous decision for us to make. I know myself, I've been on the phone, email, everything, my Facebook poll all weekend, and um, it, it is really something that impacts the whole community. The first thing I want to point out is that even though the majority of people that I've spoken to and the majority of people in behavior are vaccinated, it's not just something that we can look at the numbers because that other percent, there are family, our friends, they're not just numbers to us. And that's what makes it so hard. I've had people pour their hearts out to me and I, it just breaks my heart because, you know, these are long standing members of the community. I mean, one lady said, Linda, I've been living here for 50 years and paying taxes. My heart goes out to you, however, I firmly believe that the only way that we can get out of COVID and quickly is to get back to normal. Mm -hmm. The mental health of the community is at stake. We're arguing with each other. I mean, normally sane people are, are 
I mean, slewing insults, and that's not who we need or is. Abram is a town that comes together. And I promised a lot of people, I, I am for the recommendation because I feel our mental health, we need to get that arena open. But I promise my friends who are against it that we will keep trying to give them an option. There's other options available. Maybe we can't go with the uh, rapid testing, but maybe we can do something. I know, I mean, this is a different apples to oranges, but the churches in Yellowknife, they have their, their regular masses for 90 people. And then the last mass of the day is for the non-vaccinated people. I mean, maybe we can do something like that. But I, I swear to my family and friends that we will keep looking. I will. And if we do this now, we might not have to look. It might be over quicker. So for that reason, and I know a lot of people will be upset with me, but I feel I have to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rupert. Any other questions or comments from Council? Go ahead, Councillor Brown. Segregating the members of this community uh, will not stop the spread of COVID-19. And uh, in my opinion, there is no reasonable scientific basis for that assumption in this order. It will hurt this community. Um, I'm being told this order is legal, but uh, I'm certain that it is not legal. We have the opportunity to do right thing. And as a community, I believe that we will stand against this order. Uh, I believe we need to push the CPHO to rescind this gathering order before damage is done to members of this town that can't be done. I received more communications in the past 72 hours from residents than I received in my first three years on council. I will not trample on the rights of individuals who have declined these inoculations for personal and religious reasons, or for those who cannot for medical reasons. Like I said before, I believe that uh, as a community, we have an opportunity to do the right thing. And with that, I will not support this recommendation. Any comments from council? Yeah. Thank you, Worship. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, knowing that this meeting was coming and this was going to be uh, a part of the meeting, it's it's been quite difficult, honestly, for me. Um, I'm sure for everyone here. Uh, I've I've barely slept. I've honestly been physically sick, including today, uh, just before this meeting. Um, I worried that I wouldn't properly be able to articulate my position, so I, I wrote some points. Um, well, mainly, I've, I've had this conversation uh, with yourself as well, Your Worship, but this feels very wrong to me. Uh, any government mandate that, that segregates a part of our society for any reason is fundamentally against anything and everything that I believe. Um, and then I think that this, this order does that. To me, uh, you know, and I hope both of you listen to me, I don't feel the council actually has a choice here. There's not, uh, there, there isn't an option really to say no to this. If we say no, we're saying no to opening our arena. This is what it comes down to. I can't sit here and say that I think everybody should be allowed in the arena, and then at the same time say nobody should be allowed in the arena. Um, the stats last week, so that 75% of our eligible community, uh, including KFM, uh, which I think is a fair inclusion, they uh, spent a lot of time in our community working, spending their money and, and using our facility. 
um, are vaccinated. So that's that's great, including me. I'm vaccinated twice with with a booster shot. But uh, I also uh, not supported these orders that have happened um, over the last couple of years because it, it's been important to me to take the strain off of our proven to be fragile uh, healthcare system. And you know, it, it seemed to be the way to go about doing this. So with, with that said, another 25% of our community and AFM is not vaccinated. And the fact of the matter is some of these 25%, I don't know what the numbers are going to be at the end, but will not be vaccinated. They're not going to do it. There is no reality that exists that is going to get these people to vaccinate. So at some point, there has to be a recognition of that. We don't have to agree with it. We don't have to like it, but that, that is the fact. There will be people always that are not vaccinated. So whatever their choices are, whatever their reason, that's, that's it. And measures that keep those people segregated from our community, whether it's 5% or 10% or whatever it happens to be at the end of all of this is not right. I, I cannot, um, it, it'll never be right to me. There's no way that anyone could ever explain to me when that's where that situation is okay. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're sitting here talking about you know the, the potential for negative testing and, and how that's evolving now. That's being used in other locations. I don't expect public health in the river to have to conduct negative tests every two days or whatever it happens to be for people in the community. I don't I don't expect that. But I don't think it's necessary that they would have to do it. You can order these tests online. Every one of us can do it, approved by Health Canada to be used. And there has to be a way that that can be incorporated into this. There has to be a way that public health measures. I, I understand that the position these decision makers are in are, that are far above us. I don't envy that at all. But there has to be a way to work within the parameters of including all of society into this. Keeping people out in the cold and out in the dark is not something that's going to work in the long term. It cannot work. It, like, it's never worked before, so I don't know why we think it would start to work now. The idea is this is temporary, great. I hope it's temporary. Like, I understand why there's skeptical people about that. The last two years, everything is temporary. So I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not okay with this. But I don't feel we have a choice. We're put in a position where I feel like we're painted into a corner. We don't have an option. Close the arena or open it. It's, it's not even our choice. We're mandated right here. The town is legally required to comply with orders issued by the OCPHO pursuant to Section 3 of the Cities, Towns, and Villages Act. One of the purposes of a municipal corporation is to maintain a safe municipality. Uh, it goes on. But... Even if we vote no to this tonight, and the arena is closed tomorrow, which it probably wouldn't be anyway, but even if we were to vote no to this tonight, every one of the user groups in there has to submit their own plan. I know for a fact that plans have been submitted without a vaccination requirement that have been turned down. We had to go back and look at this again. So even if we left this on solely on the backs of our user groups, which isn't fair, it's as fair as leaving it on to us, Nobody here has a choice. These user groups don't have a choice. I don't even know why we're having this discussion, honestly. Um, they're they're going to get turned down anyway. So the, these mandates are, are here. They exist. We don't have to agree with them. We can, we can try to find other alternatives. And I think as a council, we have to do that. We have to approach our, our chief public health officer and try to find a way that we can work to incorporate the rest of our community into this because this cannot work in the long term. I'm voting in favor of this, but under protest because I don't feel that we have a choice. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to echo the thanks that I have to administration for, for jumping through all these hoops in the last week or two and, and trying to find ways to do this because I know they have been. And I also, you know, I... I just want to ask of the residents in our community that, that everyone consider, everyone, 
all of us on both sides, everybody consider a little bit of empathy and, and compassion and understanding for the position of other people. There's not uh, a situation ever where we're all going to agree on, on things, but and we're, and we're not going to understand why people don't accept this or, or that. But we all still live here. This is all, this is still our home. And we all have to go through this together one way or the other. And this the separation that's happening right now, the fracture in this community, where families are split apart over this and people are potentially losing jobs over this, this is serious. This is the this is the hardest discussion I've had in nine years on council. There's been some tough ones. Like I don't I I, I fundamentally just disagree with all of this, but again, we're we're put into a place where I don't feel we have a choice. Our hands are tied on this. So I'll vote in favor of it, but I want to see us pushing back on this. This can't just be accepted as, all right, this is what it is, and this is how long it's going to last me. We need some, we need some actual solid, concrete information that we can give to our residents and try to keep this community together. That is not the job of the chief public health officer. I understand that. Her job is public health. That is that is the singular focus right now that the whole government is, is going through because of this state of emergency that we're in. So someone needs to bring that forward that, that there's other parts of this whole thing than just public health. And I guess it's major. I'm not taking anything away from that. But there's other aspects to a functioning society that need to be presented and I, 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 I'm going to ramble on people about it. Thank you. But, uh, that's, that's what I've got. Thank you, for sure. Thank you. None of us like this. Not one of us. And I know that for a fact. Or we wouldn't be sitting here and be as passionate about what we do. It is not an easy decision. And I, too, agree with Keith that we have been painted into a corner. That it is a public health order. And nobody in here is an expert. We are trusting the experts. And um, like I said, there was a lot of work that went into this, a lot of back and forth by our director and our SAO and everybody that is involved. And they've done a ton of work trying to figure out a solution. Um, we come in here and start asking the questions that have been asked and answered. And, and then, well, maybe we can bend it this way. Um, it, it is tough and we are leaders for a reason. We are here to make these tough decisions. And, um, so with that, I am going to call the question. So all in favor of the motion? The motion carries. Against? Okay, the motion carries. Um, so with that, we have item number eight, um, which is a legal quick legal issue matter. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to go in camera. And second by Councillor Bishop. Um, all in favor? You're in camera, I'll give you five seconds. Five seconds. Yeah. Well, five, oh. However many minutes you need to go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, whatever you've got to do when you come back. Um, thank you, the administration, and I know you have a lot of